Now, now JD, I, I noticed we don't have any teleprompters here for you tonight. <laughs> it's a little just off the cuff, taking questions and also questions from the audience. What, what do you make of it, how, how strange and bizarre it is? Kamala Harris has gone 40 plus days without taking a serious interview by herself or a press conference. By the way, how great is J.D. Vance with these press conferences? He not do a great job. What do you make of that? You know, look, I mean, she's terrified of the media because she's terrified of the American people because she knows that if she speaks off the cuff, she's going to let them know just how completely radical she is. I mean, look, Kamala Harris, her entire campaign, think about this, she's trying to run away from every position that she had three and a half years ago. She said she wanted to defund the police. And by the way, we should be thinking about and praying about those two Phoenix police officers who just got shot yesterday. God bless them and thank them for, for their service. Sounds, sounds like we've got one in stable condition, and that's great, but hopefully, hopefully both of them come out of it. But look, she wanted to defund the police, now she says she doesn't. She wanted to ban fracking, now she says she doesn't. She was the border czar who opened the American southern border, but now all of a sudden she says she believes in border security. I joke with President Trump that she's going to show up at a rally one day with a long red tie and the slogan, Make America Great Again, because that's what Kamala Harris is doing. She's pretending to be, you know, we... We had a rally, Charlie, where the president he called me right before I went out, and he said, what do you think's going on here? And I said, I don't know, sir. I think maybe she wants my job. She realizes the Kamala Harris campaign is not going well, so she wants to replace me on the ticket. But we cannot let the American people forget how radical she is. She is exactly what she said she was. She is exactly what she has governed as. And the reason why she only talks to the American people with a teleprompter sitting in, in, in between them is because she knows the American people can smell a fraud, and she is a fraud and we have to remind people of it and we saw this on display at the dnc in chicago where they pretended to be something they were not now the right. radicalism they allowed to slip here or there but basically it reminds us the country is not nearly as liberal as its leaders have become that the country is a center-right country that we want borders that we do not want men in female sports right that we want sound currency. And she knows that if she ran as what she truly is, a San Francisco liberal, that the people would reject that soundly. So we must not just remind her, but let's go through that record. It's very important. Just yep. on the police in particular. What did she do in 2020, four years ago? She donated to a bail fund. Is that correct? Yeah, that's, it's almost hard to believe, Charlie, but I've looked this up. It actually is true. Remember when there were rioters in the summer of 2020 that burned down the city of Minneapolis and a bunch of other cities on top of it? Now, they didn't catch a whole lot of them, but they did catch some of those rioters. And guess who was at the front of the line trying to bail them out of prison? Kamala Harris, who now says that she supports police officers. We can never let her forget it. She was bailing out the people who were attacking police officers and burning down a great American city. That is the record of Kamala Harris. And let's have a president like Donald J. Trump who actually supports our police officers to keep us safe. It's very simple stuff. Now, but, but it actually gets worse, Charlie, because Kamala Harris, she likes to say that she was a tough-on-crime prosecutor. Her record as prosecutor is that she turned San Francisco into the high-crime problem that it is today. San Francisco, by the way, one of the most beautiful cities in the country before Kamala Harris got a hold of it. And after she let the drug cartels, the drug dealers, and everybody else take hold of San Francisco, you're now at a situation in San Francisco where if you call the police, unless you're getting actively assaulted, they will say sometimes, call us back in a couple of hours. They're so overwhelmed, and that is the record of Kamala Harris. So we can't, again, Charlie, this is so important, we can't let people forget forget exactly who she is. And remember, it's not just that she said all these crazy things back in 2020, it's that she has governed like a San Francisco well, liberal. And, and this is the kicker, that she's also attempting to do some sort of a mind manipulation trick. She's the current vice president of the United States, right, everybody? <laughs> she's in office right now. So, it, I, Charlie, it, it takes a, a special level of shamelessness. And maybe I've only been in politics for two years, so I just haven't reached that level. But to look at the American people, even though she's reading off a teleprompter, and to say, on day one, we're going to make groceries and housing more affordable. On, on day one, Kamala Harris says this, we're going to tackle the American southern border. Kamala, day one was three and a half years ago. What the hell have you been doing the whole time?
and 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 you'll, and you'll have to forgive me. Thank you, thank you, but you're. All the pastors are going to have to forgive me because I do sometimes talk like my mammal. And she was a woman of a very serious Christian faith, but she did love the F word every now and then. So hopefully that's the only curse word that I have. Faith. I'm going to try the to rein it faith. in. Yeah. That's right. We've got, you know, we've got, we've got faith. I need a little grace here. The, uh, but the shamelessness, as you were saying, is remarkable. And this is important. She'll say on day one, I'll do this. So, okay, let's just take one example. If she was serious about securing the border, which for those of us that live here in this state, we are being invaded on a daily basis. We are being invaded. And it's so frustrating because a Democrat will be running for office and they'll raise a bunch of -of out-of-state money like Ruben Gallego and previously Mark Kelly, and they'll run all these ads where they'll see – they'll literally walk alongside Trump's border wall. And then they'll go to the Senate and vote against everything, but they will lie to the vote. You guys have seen those ads, right? And they are open border candidates. Kamala Harris now has Trump's border wall in her advertisement. And so was she not Uh, That's hard to believe. Even for me, that's hard to believe. No, it's true. You guys saw that. The Trump's border (laughs) wall was in her ad. She stopped construction of the border wall on day one. That's what Kamala Harris did. So is, is it the border wall that's laying on the ground? Because that would be appropriate because that's what Kamala Harris actually did. But it's, it's also, my friends, you go through the list of policies. Board, I mean, some of this stuff is really hard. Public policy sometimes is really tough. Border security is actually not that hard, okay? It's simple. One, empower the Border Patrol to stop the bad guys when they try to come across, right? That's number one. Number two... Deport, deport people who come into this country illegally. That's number two. And number three, number three is don't let people claim asylum and then bounce around in our country for 12 years awaiting a court date. Make them stay in Mexico if they want to claim asylum. That's the remain in Mexico policy that works so well. And the contrast between President Trump, who did all of these things, he implemented the Remain in Mexico policy. He actually came up with it. He did actually deport people. He didn't let people take advantage of our asylum process. Kamala Harris on day one promised she was going to undo all of that stuff, and that's exactly what she did. And we have the border catastrophe now because of that. And Charlie, we have to remember here the uh, incredible human toll of this stuff because we have American citizens right now who are dying of fentanyl overdoses that the Mexican drug cartels are bringing into our communities. We have thousands. This is hard to believe. We have thousands of missing children because Kamala Harris has let the cartels sex traffic minors in our own country. And I, you know, you, you know my, my story, Charlie, but you know, I, I was raised by a woman who struggled with addiction for a big chunk of, of my early life. That's one of the reasons why my grandmother played such a big role for me. And, you know, mom, I remember took something that she shouldn't have taken and it almost took her life. And she was in a coma for a few days. And I remember praying, you know, Lord Jesus, please let mom wake up this time. And because she didn't take fentanyl, she did get that second chance. And she's been clean and sober, by the way, for almost 10 years. And God bless her. And I'm, I'm so thrilled for that. But imagine, Charlie... If the poison that Kamala Harris is letting come across the border today had been coming across 15 years ago, I don't think that I would have gotten that second chance with my mom. And so to Kamala Harris and to every broken D.C. politician from Ruben Gallego on down, if you're not going to do your job and you're not going to stop this poison from coming to our country, our message on November 5th is you are fired. Get out of there. We've actually got some political leaders who are going to work for the American people. And... According to the Department of Homeland Security, it's 320,000 missing children. And and here we are in a house of worship, a house of the Lord. And we as Christians, that alone should be a reason to vote for Donald J. Trump and J.D. Vance. Absolutely right. That right there. And can you speak to that, J.D.? Because we as Christians, 
must care about the children. It is so clear in the scriptures. It says, it is better for you to have a millstone hung around your neck and thrown into the sea than to go after one of these little ones. Amen. And 320,000 children. J.D., it's almost hard to believe. It is hard to believe. But this is what our government leaders have done, 320,000 kids. And we know, by the way, a lot of those kids have lost their lives. A lot of those kids are being sex trafficked by some of the most evil people in the world. This is the wages of Kamala Harris's disastrous border policy, and it's happening every day in this country. We have to remember that they told us that Kamala Harris was the compassionate person when it came to the border. Remember when that? Remember when they said Donald Trump is the person who wanted to separate families? No. The way that you keep families together is to send a message that if you want to come through this to this country, you've got to come through the proper channels. When you empower these cartels, when you tell everybody that they can come across illegally, that's what causes family separation on an industrial scale. Never let them tell you that Kamala Harris's border policies are compassionate. There are 320,000 voices of children crying out, telling us Kamala Harris is not compassionate. She is a disaster, and we cannot promote her to the Oval Office. And there's, they, they frame it as, you're right, a compassion issue. And it's not compassionate for anyone involved, including yep. also, you guys feel it in our neighborhoods here in the Valley with crime going up and the break-ins, and you guys see what's happening. And it's happening all across the valley right now where we have seen the toll of this illegal invasion, and they're sending them all across the country as yep. well, where every single state has now become a border state. And now, God forbid, and I want you to speak about this, J.D., because you speak about it so eloquently, God forbid, and this happens all the time, unfortunately, a 16-year-old makes a mistake at a party yep. at 2 a.m. on a Saturday where he takes a drug, that otherwise would have just been, you know, a, a, a bad night, but he could end up dead because of yes. something laced with fentanyl. Can you speak about that? Because that is every yeah. week we see that story coming out of the valley. Yeah. So I was in Valdosta, Georgia, just a couple of weeks ago, and they're, they they show me the interdiction unit where they interdict all the drugs that are coming into Valdosta, Georgia, 60,000 town, very small town, boxes and boxes of candy. I'm talking about like Sour Patch kids, nerds, things like that. And I said, why are these in here? And it's because the cartels have figured out that if they make this stuff look like childhood candy, it's more likely to get through. So now what happens when a kid picks up a packet of nerds on a playground or opens up a packet of candy in his high school and now that kid is going to die because he took a piece of candy? Or, or even to take it a step up, I mean, we're in a church and we believe in the Christian faith and forgiveness. We believe in second chances. It's one of the core messages of the gospel. I, I, it really bothers me when you hear about some kid who, you know, they smoked, they smoked a joint and it was laced with fentanyl. Or they got into a pill and it was laced with fentanyl. And now a childhood mistake took their life. And you'll even hear sometimes when I talk about this, you'll hear sometimes people on the radical fringe say, well, they shouldn't have taken that in the first place. And that totally misses the point. And, and by the way, have some compassion for your fellow citizens, right? But I, I, I know, Charlie, you've got... You've got young children. I've got a seven-year-old, a, seven a four-year-old, and a two-year-old. They're with me here in Phoenix, actually. They came, they came with us. We even brought the dog. Um, German shepherds don't like the Phoenix weather, it turns out. But, I, I, you know, I think I want my kids to grow up in a country where our neighborhoods are safe enough. They, they can make a mistake without it taking their life. And I want them to be able to deal with their childhood mistakes and with their problems and with their sins at church instead of having it destroy them. And that is what Kamala Harris has done. She's taken safety away from our kids. She's taken second chances away from our families. And, and from a policy perspective, this is a decision. This is not happening to us. This is a very important thing, right. is that the Democrats and Kamala Harris, they frame the border issue as if it's this uncontrolled thing happening and that we have to just kind of manage it, as if it's like a natural disaster. Let's be clear. We are allowing it to happen. What is happening is an act of the will. Can you speak about that, J.D.? Yeah, I mean, it's an unnatural disaster, and her name is Kamala Harris, right? That's exactly what's going on here, is we've got leadership... 
that refuses to do its job. I mean, we have to remember, they came in bragging about the fact that they were going to undo every single one of Donald Trump's border policies. Remember that? Remember three and a half years ago when Kamala Harris didn't pretend to be a border hawk? She pretended to be what she is, an open borders radical, and they said, we're going to do this on day one. We're going to suspend deportations. We're going to end the Remain in Mexico policy. They did every single thing that they promised that they were going to do, and now they're trying to run from the consequences. And the way that they get away with this, this is so important, Charlie, the way that Kamala Harris gets away with this massive dishonest operation is for us to not get out and vote and penalize these people. When our politicians lie to us, we have a response and we have an ability to push back. It's at the ballot box. So get out there, tell Kamala Harris, you are fired. And we're not going to reward people who gaslight us and lie to us about what they've done in office. And th this state is the, the, one of the most consequential and one of the most crucial, which is why you're here. Huge. Especially this part of the valley. And just to reiterate what I said earlier, every single one of you going out with turning point action and to chase ballots and to register voters, J.D., we're seeing in this state – one of the buried leads is that this state is actually becoming more Republican, not more Democrat. In 2020, here, here. In 2020, we had about 100,000 more registered Republicans than Democrats. Four years later, we now have 260,000 more registered Republicans than Democrats. So we have become, and that's net, that is a net increase. That's huge. And it's happening because everyday Americans are seeing the failure of the open border policies, of seeing what's happening internationally, which I definitely want to talk about, which does not get enough attention recently. But also, Phoenix especially, and everyone here is feeling it, it used to be a decade ago one of America's most affordable cities. Remember that? Remember you used to brag to all of your friends and family in Chicago, L.A., and New York, well, come to Phoenix, you can afford anything. We are getting crushed yep. by inflation here. Inflation in the Sun Belt is the worst in the country from housing prices to grocery prices. Why is this happening, J.D.? Explain it, and what will Trump Vance do about it? Yeah, so inflation is obviously complicated, but in some ways it's very simple. When you let in 20 – when you talk about housing, for example, you let in 25 million illegal aliens into this country – on the one hand, they're going to compete against Americans for scarce homes that are out there. And then Kamala Harris cast the tie-breaking vote for the Inflation Explosion Act. So mortgage interest rates are higher, home prices are way higher, and now Americans can't afford to buy a home. That is what is, that's exactly what's happened, right? You bring in too many people, you have them compete against Americans, and then you drive mortgage interest rates through the roof. That's exactly what Kamala Harris has done. Now, she's also, of course, gone to war against American energy. And energy goes into everything, right? You want to manufacture anything, you need energy. Our farmers want to transport food to the grocery store, they got to do it on trucks. The trucks require energy. So when you raise the cost of energy, then you raise the cost of everything else. Kamala Harris would rather us buy oil and gas from tin pot dictators all over the world. I think we ought to buy energy from American workers and from American territory, and that'll create a... And Charlie... That, that'll create a lot of jobs, man, but it'll also drive down the cost of everything. I mean, we have to remember, you know, 30 years ago, and I hear this from Democrats, I hear this from independents, I will hear people say, you know, 30 years ago, our parents just working a normal American middle class job could afford to buy a home. And they could afford to send their kids to a school where they were going to get an education and not an indoctrination. And even if you weren't rich, you could trust that your kids were going to walk down the street in safe neighborhoods. We have taken all of that away except for the very rich and privileged people in this country because they can afford private security and they can afford to send their kids to school wherever they want to and they can afford when Kamala Harris raises the price of energy by 50 percent. You know who can't afford it? The gross majority of American citizens. And we cannot forget that when these guys say that they stand for the common man or they stand for working people, you know who stood for working people and his policies backed it up? Donald J. Trump for four whole years. And when Donald Trump was president, 
one of the least reported economic miracles was the blue collar boom. Amazing. Where those that worked with their hands, the muscular class, and I see some of you guys out here, the plumbers, electricians, the welders, those of you that shower before work and after work, those of you that are talked down to by your leaders because you don't have a college degree. By the way, I'm right there with you. I didn't go to college either, by the way. You guys are building the country with your hands and you're increasingly joining the Republican Party because our values are together. But the muscular class of this country saw their wages go up quicker than even high income earners. That's what happened when Donald Trump was president. There was a miraculous blue collar boom. And this is why, J.D., everyday voters, they might say, oh, I don't know how I feel about Trump, but my life was better when yes. Trump was president. That's my exactly life, right. I, we were richer. Our communities were safer. We had a border. That alone should decide the election. Can you talk about how blue collar America, the communities that you represent in Ohio, especially because that is really the blue collar center of this country, they were flourishing under Donald Trump. Yes, they were. And I think it's useful to go back a little bit because we have to remember, and, and I hate to say it was bipartisan, Charlie. For 30 years in this country, you had Republicans and Democrats united around a very stupid principle that America didn't need to make its own stuff. So who makes 95 percent of our ibuprofen? The Chinese. Who makes the antibiotics that we put into the bodies of our children? The Chinese. Who makes even some of the weapons that our troops need to fight with? The Chinese. Donald Trump, for the first time in 30 years, said, this is idiotic. We need to make more in America with American workers and for American people. Now, that... That was a national security imperative, right? Building thousands of American factories, that ha happened under Donald Trump. Like you say, take-home pay, especially for blue-collar workers, skyrocketed under Donald Trump's administration. So it was a national security imperative, but it also meant that a lot of people were better off. And I just want something very simple, and I know Donald Trump wants something very simple. If you work hard and play by the rules, you ought to be able to afford a home and a nice, nice life for your family. It's very simple. This is not like crazy, you got to save the world and fix every problem. We just want Americans to be able to live a decent life in the country their parents and grandparents built. It's not so much to ask. We just got to fire our broken leadership and get somebody who knows what they're doing back in the White House. Amen. Let's, let's emphasize one of those points. We have a serious housing shortage. You mentioned the illegal, yep. the illegal uh, issue here. Uh, of your comp We're competing against foreigners for homes. By the way, what a violation of the social contract that yes. your 25-year-old son, who's an American citizen, gets married, wants to have a beautiful family in Gilbert, and has to go compete against a foreigner for a home? We should not put up with that, okay? No, we should. Our homes should be prioritized for Americans first above foreigners, period. And so, can, can you speak to that, J.D.? Absolutely. Look. Charlie, this, you put it so well, this is disgraceful. Kamala Harris's entire policy is to import millions and millions of people into this country who violate our laws and then give them benefits that should go to American citizens. We could go down the line. She wants to give them homes that ought by rights to go to American citizens. She wants to give them Medicare. She said this. She wants to give illegal aliens Medicare, which would bankrupt that program and throw millions of American citizens into poverty. She wants to give them Social Security after American citizens paid into it for 30, 40 years. Kamala Harris wants to give the American dream to people who shouldn't even be here. Donald J. Trump wants to protect the American dream for people who ought to be here, who deserve to be here, and who have fought for this country their whole lives. Which is a perfect segue to her running mate. Are you guys big Tim Walls fans here? <laughs> Not, neither am I. By the way, I know what you're thinking. Are you not excited to see J.D. Vance debate Tim Walls? Is that not going to be one of the best things ever? They, they better have a mercy rule. Who, who, who's, uh, who's moderating that debate? Uh, Nora O'Donnell from CBS. And I, th I think what actually might happen based on his military service is he's going to bail out at the last minute but say he went anyway. I think that's the Tim Walls approach to the debate. By, by his own admission, he says he's not a good debater. Uh, okay, I don't know. I don't even know what to make of that. J.D. Vance is one of the best we have, by the way, as, as you could tell. 
But let's just look at the record because not only has Kamala Harris stood for foreigners over Americans in every possible way, let's look at Tim Walls. Tim Walls, taxpayer funded tuition for illegals in Minnesota. Correct me if I get any of this wrong. That's right. Uh, tax pay, uh, the the uh, driver's, licenses driver's licenses for, for illegals. illegals. And also, I know there were, there were other policies as well that were accommodating foreigners in the state of Minnesota. On top of that, there's so much there that needs to be explained, yet he does not take questions. And I want all of you to understand this. If you're an undecided voter watching this at home, because we have millions of people watching this, or if you're an undecided voter here tonight, the ticket that is willing on a daily basis to take questions from reporters is probably the ticket that should govern your country, not the one that runs away from reporters. And if I may editorialize just a little bit more, why are reporters and journalists continually providing cover for the side that won't talk to them? It's very bizarre. It's like, at some point, when will these reporters say, I'm not going to carry your water anymore because you won't even allow me to ask a question. By the way, how pathetic was that CNN interview with Kamala Harris and Tim Walls? It was, the whole thing was very weird. So, so Tim Walls with George Floyd allowed Minneapolis to burn and did not call in the National Guard within, tw you know, without, within 24 hours. Talk about Tim Walls, without a doubt, the most radical, out of touch, vice presidential selection in modern American political history. Yes, yeah, so much we could talk about, and I think it's important to reinforce this just drives home how terrible Kamala Harris's judgment is, right? Now, she says she wasn't, doesn't want to defund the police, even though she supported those policies. Then she goes and picks a VP nominee who allowed rioters to burn Minneapolis to the ground and actually pushed back against Donald Trump when he said that he wanted to send in the National Guard to save Minneapolis. And thank God, eventually, Donald Trump did exactly that. Finally, Tim Walz relented, but after, of course, $13 billion of damage had been done. This is a guy who, I was asked by John Carl of ABC, he said, you know, you accused Tim Walz of wanting to kidnap people uh, who don't want to consent to gender reassignment for their kids. And I said, well, he signed legislation, he supported legislation that would take children away from their parents if their parents don't want to do sex changes. What would you, how would you define that as anything other than kidnapping? And this is a guy, by the way, Charlie, who says that he believes in, in, in small government, that he, he wants this, the government to stay out of your bedroom. He wants the government to steal your children from you if you don't agree with Tim Walz's values. That is not small government. That's disgusting, and he should be ashamed of himself. Yes. But look, the... But the most fundamental issue, and we're going to keep on going back to it, Charlie, is you cannot stand for working people. He says that he's a union guy, that he supports union people, that he supports working people. You can't stand for working people if you're trying to import millions of illegal aliens to steal their jobs. There is, there is no way that you can square that circle. The biggest threat to American workers in this country, the biggest threat to Americans being able to afford a home is when Kamala Harris has let 25 million illegal aliens just set up shop in this country. So Tim Waltz doesn't stand for workers. He stands for the Democrat Party donors, and that's exactly who is going to serve as vice president. We're going to serve the people. That's who Donald J. And I, J. Donald J. Trump and I believe we ought to serve and we ought to fight for. So let's, let's expand on one of those points, which I think is very important. And so Tim Walls signed a piece of legislation. And what, by the way, Washington, Oregon, and California have very similar laws. And these are called trans sanctuary state laws, where effectively it is medical kidnapping where if you have a 14-year-old son or daughter that declares that they are a boy when they are biologically a girl, or vice versa, that the state has the ability to take possession and custody of your minor if you as the parent right. do not affirm the new gender that they might have learned at school or on TikTok. Is that correct, J.D.? That's exactly right. And that's kidnapping, Charlie. That is that legalized is kidnapping. kidnapping. And if you're a Christian or just a person of conscience in this country, you ought to be telling the person who wants to do that, no way. We are not letting you anywhere near the halls of power. And that's what we have an opportunity to do. But it, it's, man, it is so sick. I mean, think about this. Look. Charlie, I have an incredible amount of sympathy and compassion for some of these kids. I mean, you know, adolescence is confusing for almost every teenager, right? Every teenager goes through this or that thing. They, they go through an awkward phase. They maybe go through a goth phase. That was big when I was a kid in the 90s. Look, every, you know, kids go through this stuff. 
But now we have social media going and telling them that, hey, you know, it's not just growing up or it's not just growing pains. You are in the wrong body. And you need to go mutilate yourself to feel like a whole person again. That's a terribly scary thing for a young teenager to go through. Tim Waltz wants to take those kids away from their parents. I think we ought to encourage the parents to make those kids safe and to help them deal with whatever they're dealing with, not steal them away from the people who love them the most. It's sick, but it's... It's, it's not just sick, Charlie. It reveals an entire value set. You ask yourself, how could you be the governor of a state? How, I mean, every protective instinct that I have as a father is if I'm in a position of leadership, I'm going to fight back against the people who are trying to burn down my city. Or I, I, I've got three little kids. I'm going to fight back against the people who are trying to take my children away from me because they, they, they got a weird idea in their head from social media. Or I'm going to fight back against the people who are stealing the jobs of American workers or making it unaffordable for young Americans to buy a home. Tim Waltz, every single time he gets an opportunity, he fights for the people who are harming American citizens. We need a president who's going to fight for American citizens. We just don't have that right now in this country. A amen. And just to expand on that, think about it. A kid goes through a phase and now is able to irreversibly damage him or herself without parental consent. There's a reason why you're not allowed to get a tattoo till you're 18 years old. Right. <laughs> because you might do something that you might regret. And yet now we call that gender affirming care only President Trump and J.D. Vance stand for the children of this country against that right. horror that is happening to our children. That's right. So expanding on that, J.D., I see some of these signs out here, which is one of the 20 planks of the new Republican platform, which is no men in women's sports. It says it right there. Right there. J.D., how did we get in a place where now this needs to be a policy position? And if, if Kamala Harris or Tim Walls took questions, maybe they'd have to answer <laughs> for this. But they're okay with biological males competing in sports against females. Yeah, which is, first of all, it's so unfair to the girls. Sometimes they've competed for their entire lives to reach the height of their particular sport. And then they have to, you know, you've seen this in the swimming competitions or in the weightlifting competitions. They go up against a biological male who has advantages that are just so obvious and it's insulting to these girls. But it's also dangerous for the girls. I mean, I, you know, we, we, of our three kids, we got two boys and a girl. I, I really don't want my two-year-old to step into a competitive physical sport with a biological male because he might hurt her. And as a father, I believe that the job of fathers is to protect our daughters, not promote the people who are trying to harm them. And, and again, it just drives home how warped this value system is, right? Americans want very common sense things. They want their children to be able to afford to buy a home. They want good schools. They want safe streets. They want a closed border. Why are Kamala Harris and Tim Waltz focused on forcing biological males to compete against our girls in sports? It's insane. And it's not just that, Charlie. So th th this came up in the state of Ohio. And when I first heard it, I didn't believe it, that the Harris administration was threatening local school districts. If they didn't go along with all of the gender and transgender craziness, they were going to take away free and reduced school lunch funding. That was the weapon. That was the weapon that they were using. If you want your free and reduced lunch funding, then you need to do what we want you to do on the transgender stuff. What kind of a human being? Would, would be willing to take food out of the mouths of poor children because the local school district doesn't buy into Kamala Harris's values, that is really sick, and we don't need to be led by people like that. We need to be led by people who support American values, who, when a local school district says, we don't want Kamala Harris's values in our school district, let's make it easier for them to live their values and easier for them to protect their children, not steal money from poor kids because we want to force something down their throat. I love it. I want to get to some of our audience questions as well. You guys can ask a question on the Turning Point Action app. If you have a question for J.D. Vance, I'll get them right here. Uh, really quick, uh, there was some breaking news earlier today. Uh, big endorsement. Liz Cheney endorsed Kamala Harris. Oh, no. And oh, no. I, I, it's so interesting, isn't it? 
that every failed warmonger in the established DC, let's just say machine, is behind Kamala Harris. That the peacemakers are behind Trump and Vance. Blessed are the peacemakers, is what the right. scriptures say. Your thoughts, JD? Well, maybe the best thing, not, not the very best thing, but a very good thing that I could say about the next presidency of Donald J. Trump is that he's going to make sure that people like Liz Cheney are laughed out of the Oval Office instead of rewarded. Because this is a person, this is a person whose entire career has been about sending other people's children off to fight and die for her, her military conflicts and her ridiculous ideas that somehow we were going to turn Afghanistan, a country that doesn't even have running water in a lot of places, into a thriving liberal democracy. And for that, Liz Cheney was willing to kill thousands of your children. Liz Cheney, you know what? I think it's the best thing in the world that she's supporting Kamala Harris. You are right. Blessed are the peacemakers. Kamala Harris and Liz Cheney make very, very interesting partners. They get rich when America's sons and daughters go off to die. They get rich when America loses wars instead of winning wars. And they get rich when America gets weaker in the world. We want American strength, American security, and most importantly, peace. Let's bring peace back to the world. And Donald Trump is the candidate to do it. I, I want to emphasize foreign policy here. We, we have a question here um, from John, uh, who's using the Turning Point Action app to ask the question. Uh, he says, I, I am disgusted by the anti-Semitism I'm seeing on campuses. President Trump was the best president in my lifetime for Israel, which I know is a big issue for a lot of us here. I am disappointed with Kamala Harris embracing the anti-Semitism. Talk about that, J.D. Vance. That's essentially the question here. Yeah, you know, a couple of different things. First of all, I'm asked all the time, how do you stop the crazy stuff that's going on on college campuses or sometimes even on America's city streets? It's really simple. Enforce the law, right? I mean, you've got... you. You've got a First Amendment right to say whatever you want, even if I think that it's crazy. You know what you don't have a First Amendment right to do is harass your fellow students and prevent them from going to class. You know what you don't have the First Amendment right to do? To set up tent encampments all across America's cities, turn them into garbage dumps. Let's tear those things down and get the people in those places back to work. And, you know, one of the things I, I love about President Trump's Israel policy, about his foreign policy, period, is that he's, he's not just tough, he's smart. And you hear Republicans, we talk a lot about this, rightfully so. Donald Trump was tough. The world feared him. That was definitely true. You know what else Donald Trump was? He was smart. He conducted American diplomacy, and he recognized that when America uses diplomacy, we sometimes get a lot more out of it than if we go and, and just send a bunch of Marines into a place that they shouldn't be to begin with. And let me give you an example. So the Abraham Accords doesn't get enough credit for it. A huge deal for Israel, a huge deal for the United States of America. Here's what President Trump is saying. Allow Israel to create regional alliances with all the Arab states in that, in that region of the world. They can serve as a counterbalance to Iran. Peace, alliances, not sending Americans off to fight in a stupid war, but preventing the stupid war from ever happening to begin with. That's the Donald J. Trump approach. And man, it worked. So if you want to empower Israel and you want to allow America to focus on China, allow the Israelis to focus on Iran, right? Let them finish this war. Let them get it over as quickly as possible. Destroy Hamas as a fighting force, and then they can figure out what to do from there. America has got to make it easier for our allies to finish this war. Kamala Harris wants to prolong it. Doesn't make an ounce of sense. I, I love that. This is a question from Hayden. With rising costs on everything, daycare is very expensive. Yep. We pay $725 a month for it, and that's the lowest we've found in this area. What can we do about lowering the cost of daycare? Hayden, obviously a working family, and it's very hard for working families to get by. How will we lower the cost of daycare? It's you know, such an important question, Charlie, and I think one of the things that we can do is make it easier for family models to choose or for families to choose whatever model they want, right? So one of the ways that you might be able to relieve a little bit of pressure on people who are, who are paying so much for daycare is make it so that, that, you know, maybe like grandma or grandpa wants to help out a little bit more, or maybe there's an aunt or uncle that wants to help out a little bit more. If that happens, you relieve some of the pressure on all the resources that we're spending in daycare. Now, you talk about just daycare. Let's say you don't have somebody who, who can provide that extra set of hands. What we've got to do 
is actually empower people to get trained in the skills that they need for the 21st century. We've got a lot of people who love kids, who would love to take care of kids, but they can't either because they don't have access to the education that they need or maybe more importantly because the, the state government says you're not allowed to take care of children unless you have some ridiculous certification that has nothing to do, nothing to do with taking care of kids. So empower people to get the skills they need. Don't force every early child care specialist to go and get a six-year college degree where they've got a whole lot of debt and Americans are much poorer because they're paying out the, the, the wazoo for daycare. Empower working families. Empower people who want to do these things for a living, and that's what we got to do. All right, we have, we have two more questions here. This one here, I, I really want to see, this is, from, uh, this is from Howard. I really want to see uh, you and, Donald, uh, you and Donald, Donald Trump and you be successful. What can I do materially in the grassroots to make a difference? It's a great, another great question, and, and I'll answer it with something that a, a Senate colleague of mine, another great conservative, would say when he was out campaigning for me in the state of Ohio in 2022. He would say, I want you to go out and I want every single person in this room to vote 10 times. <laughs> and because it's a Republican audience, people sort of shifted uneasily in their seats. And I, we, I mean, we are in Maricopa County, though, Charlie. So, <laughs> But people said, look, look, we don't, we're Republicans. We don't vote 10 times. We just vote once. Well, here's the way that you can vote 10 times legally. You take yourself. 90 of your friends and family and make sure they get to the polls on or before election day. That is the way that Republicans vote 10 times. And, and you, I mean, you said, it, you said it exactly right. If just the people in this room got five of their friends to go and cast ballots, that would be the winning margin in 2020. We, we, we have the ability to do it, but we can't let our foot off the gas. Every yeah. single day, encourage people to go vote. Post on social media. If you see some dishonest crap on social media, correct it. Push back against That's it. That's exactly We're right. never going to have the media. We're never going to have the elites. We're never going to have the globalists. But we have the power of the people only if we use it. Yes, and we here at Turning Point Action and Turning Point PAC exist to make it easier for you to make a difference in this election. If you want to go find 100 new voters, if everyone here did commit 100, it is the least you can do. And here in Arizona, it makes a massive, massive, major difference. J.D., uh, final question here. we got a bunch of questions here. How can all of us be praying for you and supporting you? The grind is on. The spiritual war is on right now. Uh, we know you love this country. You've been thrown into this. Just so everyone knows, J.D. Vance did not know. He was going to be the VP selection truly until literally when it happened, right? That's like, basically right. Yeah. The, like, Mon Monday afternoon, about an hour before. Yeah, Trump, an hour before. The president called me. Yeah. yeah. And, and so he's just been thrown into this, and I think he's been doing such a great job. And I just want to encourage him, right? Such a great job. Thank you all. Well, let me let, – let me, let me give three answers to that question, Charlie. So, so, so first of all, and some of the kind pastors uh, that we met with earlier, thank you guys, and thanks for hosting us in this beautiful church. But they asked me this question, and, and I'll, I'll give a three-part answer just like I gave to them. Number one, the thing I most need is courage and wisdom. Wisdom to know the path and courage to walk the path. So if you can pray for that for me, I would appreciate it. We're out there doing... You know, we're, we're, we're trying to do the Lord's work every day. We're trying to persuade people. I need courage and wisdom. That's what I most need. I, for, for, for my wife, I'd ask, this is the second part. For my wife, I'd ask you all just to pray for strength and patience for my wife. She is an unbelievable person. I don't know if you saw her at the RNC. I, she did a great job. She's... I, I told my team, never make me follow my wife again because, you know, you want to follow somebody who's worse than you, not better than you. And she just did such a good job, and I was so proud of her. But she needs strength. She, look, she's not a political person. She, she doesn't like politics. She, you know, she said before I got involved, she said, well, I think politics, pretty much everybody's a scumbag. And, well, honey, you're right. Um, all, all but like five people. Uh, but but – she, she, I, I think she's been such a trooper about this, and she's been going out and doing her interviews. Please pray for strength um, and, and, and for courage for my wife. And the final thing is just pray for my kids that they're as insulated as the, from this as possible because they're, they're so sweet. Um, 
I, th I think all of you know, we've all seen kids at different phases, but we have a seven-year-old, a four-year-old, and a two-year-old. They're such beautiful, happy kids, and I just want them to stay that way. I don't want politics to change who they are, and so just pray that they can be as insulated as possible from this, and you know, mo most of all, just, just pray for our country. I mean, one, one of the things, Charlie, you know, I, I think that we have to do, or I should say I have to do a better job at, as the guy running to be your next vice president is, yes, there's a lot that is wrong with our current leadership. The border's wide open. We have a disastrous inflationary set of things going on that make it hard for people to afford a good life. But we still have, and I have learned this very personally last six weeks, flying around the country, driving around the country, we have the best country on the face of the earth. We have... We, we, but we, thank you all. We, we have the most beautiful country. We have the best natural resources. We have the best workers, the best traditions, the best history. The only thing that we need to fix is the broken leadership, and you all can do that. God bless you all. Thank you for everything you're doing. Vance, and please everybody. help us. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Charlie, I love you, man.